Dungeons and Dragons Hacks and Exploits. Welcome. Today we are talking about how to break Dungeons and Dragons completely. 15 million gold a day. Another exploit for Dungeons and Dragons 3rd edition. Step by step guide. Prerequisites level 11. Minimum. Will only net 3 million. Wizard. With maximum ranks in weaponsmithing. And the spells Wall of Iron and Fabricate. Method 1. Cast Wall of Iron. Creating a wall 55 ft asterisk 5 ft asterisk 2 iron equals 45.83 cubic feet of iron. This step costs 50 GP in material components. 2. Cast Fabricate, converting 11 cubic feet per cast into masterwork daggers. With 14 ranks in craft, weaponsmithing, and a wizard's crazy int, you can't fail. Repeat until only 1 2 to cubic feet of iron remains. 4 casts. This consumes your 5th level slots for the day, and takes 4 and a half minutes. The density of iron is 491 lbs slash ku feet. Thus 44 cubic feet of iron weighs 21,604 lbs. A dagger weighs 1 pound. Thus we create 21,604 masterwork daggers, which sell for 151 gp each. That's 3,262,204 gp. Over 3 million GP. At level 11. 3. 4. Profit. 5. The spell description reads you convert material of one sort into a product, that is of the same material. Therefore should any DM give you grief about singularity, connect each dagger by a thin thread of metal that can easily be clipped or removed after creation, thus giving you the countless daggers you were looking for. Folding the line of daggers may help conserve space for the plethora to be. Additional details teleportation will solve the economic problems by selling to the entire world instead of just the local pawn shop, you can possibly find a market and then spend your money to set up lots of local branch offices with people capable of casting sending or whatever to keep you informed of how business is going and what local demands are. Use this to track warfare and sell your weapons wherever they are needed. You probably won't be able to sell the maximum output of a level 20 wizard, but you'll make a very very good profit, not to mention a lot of friends in high places, if you sell at a bit below normal price. Until you flood the market, anyway. Upgrades 20th level wizard, without using any slots above 6th level. Volume of iron equals 5, asterisk, 5, asterisk, 20, asterisk, 5 over 12, equals 208.33 cubic feet. Castings of Fabricate equals 10. Use 6 level slots to fill as required. Fabricate time equals 20 minutes per day. Mass of iron fabricated equals 200 asterisk 491 equals 98,200 lbs. Number of MWK daggers equals 98,200. Payout equals 98,200 asterisk 151 equals 14,828,200 GP profit equals 14,827,700 GP per day. No fun allowed bitching about how you shouldn't allow that or, but that won't work in real life goes here. This includes now up, yaha, counter arguments. If your DM, assuming he wasn't sensible enough to put a stop to this before it begins, happens to fumble upon a Wall Street magazine article in his basement toilet, he will recognize the law of supply and demand, which states that, while the demand for said MWK daggers are roughly unchanged, the supply just skyrocketed, making said daggers essentially worthless. Congrats. Infinite multiverse equals equals infinite demand. Suck on that, Malthus. Infinite multiverse equals equals infinite supply by the same logic. Infinite supply plus infinite demand means the price is infinitely stable, since no matter how many daggers you make it won't make a dent on infinity. You need to understand how infinity or infinities work. There are actually many different sizes of infinity. For instance by definition the set of natural numbers is infinite. The set of rational numbers is however infinite, and also infinitely larger than the set of natural numbers. So the hash of natural numbers divided by the hash of rational numbers is zero, even though both are infinitely large, and the inverse of that quasi-exotic fraction is infinity. 
there are an infinite number of larger and smaller infinities beyond that as well. For instance there are infinite number of irrational numbers between any two rational numbers, so the number of irrational numbers is a much bigger infinity than even the infinitely large set of rational numbers, which is already infinitely larger than the set of natural numbers, which too is infinite. Now for what this has to do with the economics of trying to sell infinite daggers in an infinite multiverse. In an infinite multiverse, infinite summons have already come up with this scheme and tried, using the money produced by it, to scale it up infinitely across the infinite multiverse with infinite time before you arrived. This infinite time for infinite scale up across infinite universes should be a much larger infinity than the infinite number of universes. Thus the cost of daggers in the infinite multiverse should have gone to the tiniest fraction above zero already, with the infrastructure necessary to bring it to zero anywhere at a moment's notice, to cut in on new upstarts trying to get into the game already managed by the, infinitely, old rackets. Thus, if you are currently playing in a universe where daggers aren't already all but free there is only one possible explanation, the gods, and or whatever else governs and makes rules for the universe you are in thought the infinite dagger rackets were dumb and struck a deal with them, these rackets would stay the hell out of their universe, fine by them. There are infinite other universes where they can still run their business or businesses, in trade for keeping any N00 BS from starting up this BS from scratch in the universe, or turning said N00 BS over to these infinite multiverse wide dagger making mafia. Thus, the second you start up this BS practice in a universe where daggers are not already all but free, the gods, or whatever, governing your universe have to make good on their deal to the infinite dagger rackets of the infinite multiverse and turn you over to them. These rackets meanwhile have had infinite time and resources to prepare for you, as well as the infinite number of other infinitely late upstarts who think they are so clever and new, but are actually infinitely behind the curve. As such, you are in big trouble. Trouble that has command over literally anything, that can be bought for any sum of money across all the infinite multiverse to deal with, and make an example of you, that will be infinitely memorable for all times and places of infinity. You would have been better off, if you had just done something safer like merely mortally offended the entire retty of the pantheon in your own universe. TL. Doctor. 3D printing infinite daggers will quickly reveal itself to be a very dangerous, and loosing proposition in an infinite multiverse. So in a finite universe economics says dagger price goes to zero, and in an infinite multiverse logic says you end up worse than dead faster than you can imagine point 71. Point 126. Point 226. Point 110. 2051. The 14th of December 2017. UTC. Infinite in size, does not automatically mean infinite in age. So while there would indeed be an infinite number of people who already had this idea before you, they would not have had infinite time to prepare for you. Point 134. Point 129. Point 58. Point 170. 2119. The 4th of October 2018. UTC. 1. Implying the DM's world is an infinite multiverse 2. Even if it were, implying the PCs have unlimited access to it. When the market for masterwork daggers is saturated, you move on to slightly less profitable objects like masterwork swords, chainmail, farming implements, dragon shaped paperweight and so on. By the time the demand for iron goods of any kind has dropped too low to make a profit, you are well into fuck you money. A masterwork dagger would have to be made from steel, not just iron, which requires a significant element of heating, carbon inclusions, and forging. The fabrication spell wouldn't be able to produce the carbon necessary, you would require a wall of steel variant, to make this work that said, you can still crash the iron market at will. The spell description reads, you convert material of one sort into a product, that is of the same material. This could be interpreted as meaning you can only create a single item with a single casting. However, as stated earlier, you could create 21,604 masterwork daggers bound together into a single piece through a series of easily removed channels. The final object may not be a masterwork dagger, but it would be a masterwork collection of daggers joined by channels and each dagger can be considered a masterwork fragment of the original work, even after they are separated. Given the wizard's intelligence and smithing skill, these kind of engineering and planning challenges can be considered trivial. 
a DM worth the name should be able to come up with scenarios either preventing this or making the player pay for their arrogance. If it is allowed to happen, it should only happen once and will shift the world economy drastically. Other NPC wizards can be considered to be just as intelligent as the PC and will quickly figure out what's going on and want to cash in on this. The player may make some money, but will soon find the market saturated ahead of them. This would be followed by masterwork iron goods being commonplace and worth about as much as your common dagger had been. If the DM wishes to suppress this before it happens, invent a group or groups of wizards who have already discovered or done this and are carefully controlling the market so as to avoid crashing it. They've already put things into motion to detect if some other wizard rediscovers the technique. Once the PC tries to cash in, they'll quickly find out about it and act as necessary to suppress the effort. The spell description also reads, material component, the original material, which costs the same amount as the raw materials required to craft the item to be created. This means that you can't fabricate a number of daggers, just because you have the same weight of material. Since they cost about 100 GP in raw materials, you must use 1000 pounds of your wall of iron to make each masterwork dagger. The remaining weight of course goes back into the void, where it came from. Several million GP's worth of product in 4 and a half minutes is not the same as several million GP's worth of sales in 4 and a half minutes. No sentient shopkeeper is going to think they can move an entire store's worth of identical products that they likely already have 3 or 4 of sitting unbought on the shelf. It may take less than 5 minutes to create the stock, but it would take months to sell it. Unless you can make a name for yourself as an arms dealer supplying kings and warlords with armies worth of equipment, you'd probably be better off just trying to sell the iron to craftsmen. Nothing in the fabricate spell suggests that it allows smelting or metallurgy. Iron is a sufficient material for making daggers, but it isn't state of the art for even normal blades. Compared to the fine steel of a masterwork dagger, iron is softer, more easily broken, or bent out of shape without returning to true, and does not hold as fine an edge. Using this method would not yield any number of masterwork daggers, but instead the indicated number of finely shaped daggers of a substandard material. They would be more valuable for the raw metal than as weapons, outside of any town with a crippling dagger shortage. With this method, you would burn all your 5th level slots to turn 21,604 pounds of iron into 21,604 pounds of iron in a different shape without improving at all on its value. Just fabricate the wall into 1 pound iron ingots connected by small channels. According to the SRD 1 pound of iron is 1 SP. Not quite 15 million GP a day, but still enough to crash the market. Price fixing is also an issue. The value of spill casters is fixed per the hirelings section. A 6th level spell cast by an 11th level wizard with a 50 GP material component costs 710 gold. Therefore, the value of any wall of iron is set at 710. Slightly more for a higher level caster, meaning you cannot fabricate more than 710 gold worth of masterwork daggers from a single wall of iron as per the description of fabricate. Don't try this in Pathfinder either. D&D 3.75 added this wonderful line, iron created by this spell is not suitable for use in the creation of other objects and cannot be sold. It's magic, they don't have to explain it. Well, aside from the new questions that the statement raises, is a 1000 pound section of wall incapable of crushing a man, as that would be a type of use? Has the iron been made magically incapable of being sold? Does a force field spring up any time someone tries to hand you money in exchange for a piece of it? If you hide a lump of the stuff in a bag of apples, then sell the bag and its contents, the bag won't move, a la an immovable rod, you can still run a grift with fake shoddy daggers, or make a profit in trade instead of currency, it could be very very poor quality iron, something like 50% impurities, that's not worth the fuel needed to forge it into anything. It can theoretically be sold to anybody who needed 1000 pounds of hard weight, but then they could just go grab a boulder that's lying around. Because you need to be a level 20 wizard to pull this off, at which point you've got better things to do than selling 98,200 pounds of iron. 
regardless of any other imaginable or factual details regarding spells such as these it should be clear to any DM that in a world where blacksmithing, this may not always be the case, so it's probably better to say a world or worlds, where mundane weapons are made without spells like this, your character would not be the first to think of doing something as mind-numbingly obvious as this. In other words, if this was possible then why would anyone bother to become a blacksmith? Any self-respecting wizard would smack his head at the thought process behind all this and just cast a first level charm person on whoever he wanted and have them give him all their money, assuming he cared about riches. Also, creating a huge supply of iron out of nothing would add weight to the planet and can potentially do all sorts of crazy things, such as knocking it out of orbit, slowing it down, etc. Peasant Railgun. The Peasant Railgun, DND, is a weapon of mass game-breaking destruction that relies on a few basic rules in the DND system and total ignorance of the rules on the DM's part, readying actions in the length of a combat round, 6 seconds. Creating a Peasant Railgun 1. Hire a ton of peasants, let's just say that it is 2280. Line them up in single file, this will form a chain of peasants 2 miles long. It'd have been 4 miles back in my day, witness me hiking up my 2nd edition suspenders. 2. Buy a ladder. Just buy a standard, 10 foot ladder. Disassemble the ladder into a bunch of rungs and a pair of mighty 10 foot wooden poles. Hand a pole to the peasant at the back of line. 3. First round of combat. Peasants at the front of line read as an action, to throw the pole at the enemy. Every peasant behind him read as an action, to hand the pole to the peasant in front of him. 4. Next round. Peasants fire off their readied actions, passing the pole 2 miles down the line and hurling it in 6 seconds or less. Pole accelerates to the speed of 1188 miles per hour, or Mach 1.546875 in dry air, at 20 deg point C slash 68 deg point F, at sea level on our planet. 5. Peasant railgun can be reloaded and fired in less than 12 seconds. 6. Variations. Really, your choice. Weapon is scalable. You could use your peasant railgun to fire a number of things at a really long range. Add more peasants to make the weapons even faster. Paint them red to make them faster. Use gobbus to make a DND grot cannon. Hurl pointy bombs for heat weapons. Severed heads make an impressive psychological warfare tool. It's even more wild with a bag of holding. Place a team of fighters in it for dynamic entry over castle walls and shit. Hurl some fucking bear cavalry directly into enemy lines. Who knows? You can also throw a halfling monk to take full advantage of flurry of blows at 1200 miles per hour. And if you go with a falling object rule for 5e with the wooden rod, being 7 pounds, you have 5 to 9 pounds per 60 feet do 2d6, making the rod going about 2 miles per 6 seconds, making it do. 300d6 a turn. Combine this with the 15 million gold a day trick and you're ready to absolutely ruin your DM's day. 7. 8. Mathurfer King Prophet. Practical applications a campaign I was in recently employed a peasant railgun in a large scale battle. Our mage was a dumbass and decided to launch an old chemical flask from said railgun and into the heart of the enemy forces. It blew up and killed a bunch of the enemy. RDM got back at us by making it tear a big asshole in the time-space continuum. The same mage decides to approach the hole, and when he touches it, it blasts him across the fucking map and vaporizes some more enemy troops. Our mass was 3.628796 kilograms, 8 pounds, the weight of a first edition 10 foot pole. Our speed was 536.448m slash s. 1200 miles an hour. The final kinetic energy was 520,005 joules. This is similar to 125 GFTNT, or a half of a stick of dynamite. It's not exactly a weapon of mind blowing destruction. The maths breaks it before the GM has to. It gets worse. For the weapon's sake, when one considers drag, that would tear the projectile apart into a flaming swarm of splinters before it reached the end of your peasant chain. The only way this thing works is if uh, your GM allows for real world physics to translate into the game B. Your GM doesn't actually know real world physics an alternative use that requires a lucid DM, but allows real world physics, partially, to still come into play. Instead of a regular 10 foot pole, use a heavy lance, or, if your GM will allow it, a ballista bolt, or whatever made of riverine. 
as Riverine is stated to be immune to anything except for things like disintegrate, it can be argued that it would be immune to the compression forces and such intel in a peasant railgun. Because of this, your railgun is now armed with a truly unstoppable shell. Assuming you simply extend the railgun farther, possibly by forming an open loop part way through, you can accelerate up to near light speed, allowing you to do such things as break the earth into a radioactive cloud, explode the moon, simultaneously eliminate all of existence with your near infinite mass bolt, hold all of creation hostage, terrify the living fuck out of your DM, and more. You sin deep rotten enterprising lich could utilize skeletons in a skeleton railgun to deliver goods data bits, and important things like iron rods. If you want to communicate between lich towers, all it takes is to have a conga line of skeletons set in underground passageways to a central facility. Shortly before the skeletons send parcels, they can send a routing key in the form of a 10-bit code, which the routing facility and its bank of a few hundred logic skeletons will roar out to the appropriate destination. Obviously, one could also have particle accelerators comprised of closed loops of skeletons that infinitely accelerate steel or tungsten rods to the speed of light. Then when sentry skeletons on the tops of towers spot targets, they can spot four and send signals back to the line to throw their rods up the tower chain and straight at enemies. The only problem with this would be the system wasting shots on every asshole that sets foot into the tower kill zones. So it would constantly burn through rods every day, with each tower, that needs to be defended. So other considerations would have to be made, in order to meet the iron demands for a given set of facilities. No fun allowed counter arguments telling people they can't do this, and mentions of, but in real life go here. If your DM is paying attention, and bothered reading the dungeon master guide, right where it says simultaneous activity on PG-24, and adjudicating the ready action on PG-25-26, to they will know that 6 seconds is nowhere near enough to reach the end of the line, and if you're not in combat, ready action can't be used. They can also tell you the rules on readying actions dictate none of the peasants are ready to catch the pole, meaning they are going to drop the pole right at the start. Even if they do manage to pass it forward there's one other problem. An improvised thrown weapon has minus 4 2 hit, minus 4 2 hit 4 using a 2 H weapon with 1 H, and minus 2 per range increment, and impossible to throw beyond 50 feet. Even if you had the implied momentum, the final peasant would have trouble hitting a stationary barrel. And ultimately the damage of a thrown weapon isn't related to how far it travels or its speed, so the DM could just truly you invented a fancy way to transport a 1d3 damage stick across the countryside. If your DM has ever read a physics textbook, or has the physics knowledge of an 8 year old, the projectile would shatter under the strain and the recoil would vaporize the peasants 20th century railguns need to be rebuilt after every third shot, and they are made of stronger stuff than zero level NPCs. Excusing all of the above objections, and assuming everything that makes this work, you still have the following completely systematic objection. A readied action doesn't let you automatically do something you would be incapable of doing. Once the projectile's velocity reached 80 plus miles per hour, the next peasant in line would be incapable of catching it. This would cause the peasant to drop the projectile and all other readied actions. To pass the projectile along would be lost. Even if you think the peasant could catch an 80 miles per hour projectile, what about one moving at 200 miles per hour or 500 miles per hour? Eventually you will reach a point where a peasant could not reasonably catch the speeding projectile, and that point is well before Mach 1.5 building on the already action doesn't let you automatically do something you would be incapable of doing argument. The DM could rule that, since under normal circumstances a peasant would be unable to move the pole more than 10 to 30 feet in 6 seconds, that's how far the pole travels in one round and the remaining ready actions are wasted. Building on the idea that the peasants would be unable to catch and pass forward fast moving projectiles, the DM could call for skill or ability checks from the peasants, with escalating penalties, based on how fast the pole is currently moving. These being peasants, one would fail a check almost immediately, and the remaining ready actions would be wasted, with the pole having traveled almost no distance at all. Also, the DM can rule that it works up to a point. The peasant railgun does in fact get the pole to the last peasant, who then makes a standard non-proficient attack with an improvised, thrown weapon at a first level commoner's base attack bonus. 
Peasant Railgun in Warhammer 40k The concept of a peasant railgun has always been known to the TAU, who hoard every railgun in the galaxy. However, being the presses of the 40k galaxy, with such notions as dignity and all that like, they are horrified at the idea. The Imperium, on the other hand, not being such moral joes, and having an ear inexhaustible supply of citizens to hurl at the enemy, are eyeing the idea with great interest. Rope trick. Transmutation. Second level transmutation casting time. One action components. V. S. M. Powdered corn extract. And a twisted loop of parchment. Duration. One hour per CL you touch a length of rope that is up to 60 feet long. One end of the rope then rises into the air until the whole rope hangs perpendicular to the ground. At the upper end of the rope, an invisible entrance opens to an extra dimensional space that lasts until the spell ends. The extra dimensional space can be reached by climbing to the top of the rope. The space can hold as many as 8 medium or smaller creatures. The rope can be pulled into the space, making the rope disappear from view outside the space. Attacks and spells can't pass through the entrance into or out of the extra dimensional space, but those inside can see out of it, as if through a 3 foot by 5 foot window, centered on the rope. Anything inside the extra dimensional space drops out when the spell ends. Why is this a big deal the spell creates a 3 apostrophe x 5 feet extra dimensional space, centered on the rope so it can be used to bypass thin doors and walls. The bigger use of this spell is to create impenetrable rest areas that require neither guards nor sleeping shifts, and which allow for parties to stop, prepare, and plan, even in the middle of an enemy's invincible doom fortress. The extra dimensional space holds 8 people by default and lasts long enough for a full night's sleep at 8th level, or 5th level with extend spell feats to use up a 3rd level spell slot, meaning the only difference between this and Magnificent Mansion is that this doesn't have butlers or food by default, and this is a 2nd level spell. And then there's ambushes. The spell is dismissible, players inside the extra dimensional space can see out, and the minimum altitude of the window is only 5 feet up. The party could arrange themselves in battle formation inside the space, assuming there's somewhere to stand, wait for an enemy to come by, and then dismiss the spell and apparently drop out of thin air. For higher level fun, a 5th level wizard can cast shrink item on a fair sized boulder, 1700 pounds at minimum level, assuming a limestone boulder of just the right size, and cover a party of 5 with feather fall. Now the hapless enemy finds several huge boulders dropping on their head from 30 feet up, followed by a squad of feather falling adventurers. Why this may not work the spell creates a 3 apostrophe x 5 foot doorway into an extra dimensional space. Read that again, your 8 people are all hanging from a rope in outer space, with nowhere to get off and lounge. However the spell states you can pull the rope up into the space and the door is closable, so they will not simply fall out. No fun allowed anything that can see invisible, don't forget the second level spell, will see the dimensional window you opened. The DM will likely have an ambush waiting for you, or if they have had enough of your bullshit, set up an ambush and cast dispel. Wait, this is not intentional? Our party has been using rope trick as shelter ever, since we first started playing. Please do not forget to subscribe, like, comment, and share. Also, visit my friend Jason Brazil's channel and throw him a subscribe while he's waiting out his strike. Link in the description.